Halen Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and there's nothing more Swedish than Bjorn Borg carrying three Borg babies and a baby Bjorn for Borgs. That was me from the September 30th episode of Discoverage, where we were talking about the Lower Decks episode, I, Excretus, and this is our annual holiday clip show. 2021, you little, you, you, a year that, like many before it, started off not all that great, but held, it seems, some promise for better times ahead. I think this year has proved conclusively, however, that we've got a lot of work to do before all of our troubles are behind us. And one last parting shot on the way out the door, Betty White has passed away at the age of 99 and 11 twelfths. Sad news. Uh, it's just the day before she was in the middle of a playful internet fight with Ryan Reynolds. Uh, if that guy's not doing the eulogy, I, I, you're doing something wrong. 2021, in your final hours, you still take from us. From hell's heart, I stab at thee! Because we are celebrating the year that was by playing some of our best clips from 2021, featuring the funny, talented, and fascinating guests from the show this year, talking about Trek, and honestly, taking the conversation all kinds of places, talking about a lot of stuff that is in Trek as well. Let's get right to it. To begin, on the first episode of this year, I spoke with Darren Mooney of The Escapist. Darren is a film critic, and he also has a podcast called The 250, where he looks at the top 250 films on imdb.com. And we talked about the particular character of that famous list. Like, so you, you mentioned there that, like, the top 250 has a character, and it definitely does have a character. We're talking about movies like Fight Club. I mean, you, you mentioned The Shawshank Redemption as the best movie of all time. I don't know how much time we have, but very quick. Quickly, um, do you know how that happened? Because this is this is very revealing and not in a very flattering way. Well, I know, you know how... I know that the film was not a success upon release, <laughs> but somehow has become like this cherished treasure, you know, for men of a certain age. Well, the, the reason why The Shawshank Redemption is the greatest movie of all time on IMDb is because it was the last man standing in a voting war between Godfather and Dark Knight fans, where each was pathologically <laughs> downvoting the other. Like there okay. were campaigns and bots and wars being waged, where the Godfather was the incumbent at number one, and the Dark Knight was coming up fast behind it. And everybody was getting so intense with this that by the time like the dust settled and the blood was on the floor, Shawshank Redemption, which had managed to avoid upsetting the Dark Knight fans and kind of or the Godfather fans just kind of waltzed to the throne after that <laughs> just and, slipped out through the pipe <laughs> yeah that's it exactly no, nobody hates nobody hates the Shawshank Redemption that's right? true um, yeah but like, yeah, and you're right that it is dominated by this kind of like very middle-aged male gaze or kind of like, you know, I was 12 in 1999 kind of male gaze. Sure, so films yeah. like, say, Fight Club yeah. um, are in there as well. And, you know, films like Pulp Fiction. That's, it's a lot it's of in my Tarantino DNA, too. I totally randomly oh. picked The Dark Knight and The Godfather. And then now you're telling me that it's like this three-way <laughs> war between them. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, like, I love those films. I think those films are legitimately great and fantastic. But, but, but like, you look at a list of 250 films and you're like... Yeah, maybe, maybe we can see a little bit of diversity creeping in there. And to be fair, it is happening. So obviously I mentioned the Indian stuff, but even films like, say, Capernaum, uh, which is, you know, kind mm. of like this mm. this film that performed, this lovely little indie film, It Coming In, stuff like, say, Autumn Sonata, Ingrid Bergman's kind of like Swedish mm. language kind of like showcase coming in as well. And you see changes happening gradually over time, but it's very slowly and it's very much kind of pebbles down the side of a mountain. And it's very, very clearly happening with pushback. So like, I know without looking that like promising young woman will never make the list because of its content mm. its theme and because of how it's sold i know that's never going to happen author james swallow joined me on episode two to talk about his voyager episode memorial but we also talked about sports in star trek and the weird persistence of baseball in the 24th century uh, i don't think we get an idea about whether hockey is like uh, an active and alive sport uh, in the future but tom certainly does love it and it's great to hear that you're a fan of hockey uh, being somebody from from the UK. Um, I, I don't really know where Tom is from. I think Jerry Taylor uh, pins his birthplace as uh, California in, in her books or novels. But of course, uh, being the son of uh, a uh, Starfleet captain and later admiral, he probably traveled around a lot. But it's, it's interesting to think how in the future, that kind of regionality wouldn't necessarily apply to people's love of things. I mean, even just um, satellite TV and the internet has created a lot of um, uh, soccer or football fans uh, in America and, and around the world. 
Mm, you'd have to. I mean, we we see um, in terms of baseball teams, we see was it the Pike City Pioneers? I think was mm-hmm. on the mm-hmm. uh, Cest- on the planet from the planet Cestus Three, right? So would it right. be we'd have uh, you'd have planet side teams rather than teams that would be based in a particular city. Yeah, just people uh, picking up sports, uh, alien sports, you know, sports from other cultures or other colonies. Um... Of course, uh, that doesn't explain why. It doesn't explain why baseball's dead. I know Michael Piller loves baseball, but he kills it in his in his first script for for the show. So I don't know. It's interesting to me though that the, the, the kind of Cisco brings it back almost as, you know, because we're living in an era where baseball is still a living, breathing sport. But from yeah. him, his point of view, it's this, you know, it's like somebody getting into kind of medieval chamber music. Sure. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Bringing something back to life that hasn't been like you know a thing for, yeah. a, for a very long time. Yeah, there's a there's a, a nostalgic sort of element to it, but hopefully, um, uh, with the uh, with the uh, the death of the uh, of the emissary, perhaps uh, baseball has become uh, widespread among the federation. We don't know. I kind of like the idea that um, at Cisco, as the emissary on Bajor, maybe reintroduced bas- uh, baseball to Bajorans. Oh, it's like a primarily a, a Bajoran activity. Yeah, that's that's interesting. You can imagine that you can imagine that they were kind of like, well, if the emissary thinks this is cool, maybe we should. It's try. part of our culture. Yeah. <laughs> On episode three point five, Gooey Fame of Backtrekking and the Virtual Theater Podcast joined me for a look at Star Trek Is dot 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 the original Star Trek pitch document by Gene Roddenberry. And in true backtracking fashion, we ended up comparing the Super Mario Brothers movie and the Voyager episode Distant Origin. That that, that is a good idea, but if they went a little too far. Because then they also had like, oh, we've got technology that can de-evolve things. And it's never yeah. really important other than to like turn, you know, uh, what's his name into a, a Koopa Trooper. And we still evolved into like people with like, right, like human skin. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, but somehow I am an actual uh, still a lizard person. Yeah, I think the Voyager episode, from what I remember, kind of nails like being more of a. I I don't I would say nails, but like it's it's like a realistic interpretation of how that would go, I guess. But Mojo Nixon would have made it better, though. Mm, yeah, yeah, he yeah he would improve anything. A little bit of Toad in there. <laughs> uh, they've got the women duplicating a page. <laughs> Great title from the old west. Hanky panky aboard with yeah. a cargo of women destined for a far off colony. And this is um, more or less what Mud's women becomes. But thankfully, uh, no real hanky panky. Uh, everybody on the Enterprise is uh, is fairly professional. But I mean, come on. <laughs> Let them get a little. I guess I, I I saw a thing that um a suggestion that they had did this on TNG with the perfect mate. Uh yep yeah pretty much. I I can see that. I love like okay so it's like what if you were caged like an animal? What if you had powers like a god? What if Al Capone was president? What if there were women on the what ship? If had, <laughs> yeah, what if what if there were girls on the ship? <laughs> <laughs> Comedian Asterios Kokonos made his triumphant return to the show on episode six. And before we got around to talking about the TNG episode Investigations, we discussed his efforts to jack into the world of cyberpunk and how that world lags a bit behind our current technological epoch. Well, speaking of cyberpunk, uh, you've got a lot of content on your uh, content on your Patreon. You've got a cyberpunk RPG podcast. Uh, had yes, you played you Cyberpunk the RPG before you got started on that podcast? No, honestly, like cyberpunk is a genre is fantastic yeah. like it's incredibly cool and i i don't even think i need to explain why it's cool no. to your listeners but um but you know i hear that cyberpunk 2077 is coming out and then i find out that cyberpunk 2077 the the massive triple a game from one of the largest video game companies on earth is based on the original cyberpunk tabletop role-playing rpg that came out in 1988 yeah there there was a game called cyberpunk and then there was a game called cyberpunk 2020 and that was like the big one like if you've ever heard of cyberpunk you probably played cyberpunk 2020 yeah then there was another version and another version and so i said to myself like i would love to dig into the the past's version of the future like, um, you know, it's it's kind of like the like my friend Marley uh, always says about Star Trek, you know, uh, you know, they like they thought of the iPad, like, you know, a P.A.D.D., like you'd have reports on a P.A.D.D., yeah. but they also like even up until Deep Space Nine, they're like, and you'll need like a thousand of them. 
Yeah, right. Like, they, there's like, no way. They, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could have more they, than one book on it. Yeah, right. Like, it, it, they, it, they didn't even consider. Like, I don't know. Maybe you could beam your report from one to the other. Because I remember when they like, but when they're breaking like Sloan's head in Deep Space Nine, and they're right. trying to find the cure to the to the virus that to the, to the genocide virus. The yeah. Race, yeah. Right? yeah. So like, oh, which pad is it on? There's a hundred pads here. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and like Cyberpunk twenty Cyberpunk, the original Cyberpunk nineteen eighty eight is like a similar thing. Like you could have a little camera in your eyeball, but you had to push a button and then film would eject from the eye. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> A Polaroid comes out of your nose. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. And like you could have like a secret tape recorder in your arm, and it would literally have a tape in it, and it had a half an hour, and yeah. you have to like dig it out of your arm. And yeah. so it was just neat to it was neat to to do this show. We're doing a show called Jack, and you can hear the first episode for free at jackpodcast.com. Um, so it's just neat to kind of try to play true to the limitations yeah of the format it's it, it just it makes it makes an it's like an interesting look at a future that never happened sasha wood of casually comics was on episode seven to talk about the tng episode hollow pursuits and we talked about how lieutenant barkley is probably more like us than we want to admit and the ways in which we use our pastimes to craft our personas he is who we would be in this world. I'm in this episode and I don't like it. <laughs> I think that he also provides a good balance because I think a part of Trek is aspirational. I think it always should be. I think that the optimism yeah, yeah. of Trek is part of what makes it so unique in that sci-fi where it's such a dystopian landscape across the board. Then you have something like Trek that's like, but we can be awesome. So it's really yeah. nice to have that as well. But it's important to have characters like him because otherwise it does become like you can start making fun of those main characters because they become unrelatable if they don't have characters like Barkley to balance them out. So it's important to see people like that. And I think that he's a bit ahead of his time because when he's having a conversation with Jordy in 10 Ford after Jordy has caught him in the holodeck and seen the program, and it's great that it's Jordy because Jordy, of course, fell in love with that girl on the holodeck. Yeah. So he yeah. can relate like more to what's going on and they have that conversation and it's just so amazingly human and a really connective moment where he has that speech about how he can't talk to people and how you know he wishes that he could and it's just something that really always stuck with me and the other scene that stuck with me from this forever and I think it probably always will is after his second breakdown where he retreats to the holodeck and they all go yeah. get him so like Riker, Troy and Jordy <laughs> and he's there talking to Jordan. He's like, the people I create in there are more real to me than the people out here. Yeah. And that was just such a profound statement because it's something that I feel like a lot of people can relate to, especially now when you have all of these parasocial encounters where you can see, where you can kind of craft yourself, craft yeah. the person that you want to be, not just in something like Second Life or in a video game, but even with a social media persona. And I can see it being very appealing to retreat there. So in that way, I feel like Barclay is more relevant than ever. On episode 8.5, I was joined by Dan Devey of Gays in Space to talk about LGBTQ representation in Trek and the ways in which Trek has cautiously moved representation forward. He's, he's such an interesting guy, Roddenberry, because I think in a lot of ways, he seems like he wouldn't be exactly ally material. You know, he's like this old World War II vet. He's a white guy. He was a, he was a cop. And he comes up with this idea for a series where everybody's going to be equal, black, white, male, female, you name it. And yet there's still, you know, there's a lot of coded racism in early Trek stories. You know, you got the sexism, uh, the pro-war episodes, a lot of conventional American values. And then the years go by and he gets older and he's, he's ramping up the production of TNG and he's, he's talking about regretting the sexism in his early work in life. And he, he's saying it's time for gay characters on Trek. He's getting woker, as we'd say now. And yet he still can't write a good Crusher or Troy episode. You know, there's still no gay characters. We, we get things like Code of Honor. You know, it's, it's a long road towards enlightenment. Yeah. But he did, you know, he did try a couple of things to, because, you know, so many things in Star Trek happened simply because they were able to get it past the censors. Yeah, you know, like, sure, sure. They just didn't know the whole black and white episode. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, at the last battlefield, yeah. you know, like 
the idiot censors watched it and they were like, oh, how ridiculous is this? And it turns out to be one of the most powerful uh, civil rights statements like made on television at the time. And sure. they were just like, well, I don't get it. Um, but one of the things, one of the ways that he tried to include us was background. When the Next Generation episode Justice came came around, yeah. the way he saw that episode was he's, he's like, all right, our people are going to beam in. And when they beam in, I want to see half naked women kissing men, men kissing men, women and <laughs> men all uh, like intertwined. And it's just going to be like an orgy and that's what we're going to do. And I think after Rick Berman had his heart attack, he said, <laughs> okay, we can't do yeah. all that, Gene. We'll yeah. give you the hot ladies. We'll give you, you know, one or two attractive men, uh, but there will be no, you know, uh, homo, he- homo business going on there. Right. Um, but he tried, bless him, you know, he really tried to get us in and, and, and like, because that's all you need. One scene like that would have prevented people from being able to guess that we had been cured. TVs, the internet, Star Wars Minutes, Pete the Retailer of the ABCD TOS podcast returned to the show on episode 9 to talk about the TNG episode Contagion, and I asked him who was more pedantic, Star Wars fans or Star Trek fans? I, I, I feel like Star Trek fans will, will, you know, actually you for stuff that's at least represented on screen more, whereas Star Wars fans like to give you like a gotcha on something like no that was in a novel you know that was in a junior reader's novelization <laughs> how, how could you not know that that alien species was and it's like well come on like i didn't like why why, why would i know that versus yeah you know in, in in trek at least it's like related to like oh like I, no actually that thing that he's looking at on screen is is this and it's like oh okay like that you know that's that's the kind of thing that i feel like we dabble in more on on star wars minute that we're like all right if we see it on a screen then we like to have fun with oh what's the name of that and where does that come from you know right right and um but not you know just like oh like this you know going off on these crazy wild adventures which I, i'm not again i'm not going to say that you know, you know people shouldn't like the books and all that i, I think that's great that, that that you know it's an important part of of fandom is the you know novelizations and spin-off projects and stuff like that but like you can't fault somebody for not knowing stuff that's that's from these kind of disparate sources it's weird uh, because they're both you know they're both you know one's a tv production for the most part and one's a movie production and it's i don't know if that affects it or if it's the the idea that like S- Star Wars is like this legendary thing, uh, you know, when you think about it, Star Trek is they're all logs, right? These are all records of things that have like happened, right? And I don't know how that affects how people approach it, but I knew that Star Wars fans had a special approach to things when I was on Wikipedia and I saw that there was a wiki uh, wiki page for hell. Mm, because yeah. Han Solo says that he'll see somebody in hell, which is just an expression. Yeah. But now they have to come up with like, oh, um, hell is a is a chaos dimension that exists. Because and it's like, guys, guys, it doesn't what it doesn't matter. He just <laughs> says he's still see in hell. Don't take that away. Yeah, it's my favorite Wikipedia entries are just like, well, you know, because like Anakin's friend, who was like the daughter of one of the you know assistant directors or whatever, had braces when she was you know oh in, yeah yeah Phantom Menace. Now we have <laughs> so to write a Wikipedia entry for braces, and it's just like, yeah <laughs> braces are something that creatures wore on their teeth to correct them, and it's like yes right yeah I get that that's 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 we we know what braces are thank you that means uh, there's health insurance in the Star Wars universe well, hopefully. <laughs> Author Catherine Valenti was back on the show for episode 12 to talk about the infamous TNG episode Sub Rosa, and she balanced her criticism of it with a great deal of love. Candle ghost love. Why did you choose this specific episode Sub Rosa to discuss? <laughs> because it sucks. Um, <laughs> so, so I just, I want to say, much as I did the first time that we talked about an episode that wasn't very good, um, that <laughs> everything I'm about to say is said with nothing but love. I love Star Trek The Next Generation. It is a show of my heart. It is my warm milk bath. I have watched every episode of the show more times than I care to acknowledge. Uh, it is it is a huge part of my life, my psyche. I've, I've been watching it since it aired on television and I was a tiny child. 
I love this show. I love every character in it. Uh, yeah. well, most most of them. Um, every recur <laughs> every recurring character in it. Um, and uh, so everything I'm about to say about how much this episode is terrible um, is said with the joy of finding a terrible episode in season seven, which is otherwise an incredibly good season. Oh yeah. Uh, it, actually, the fact that this is in season seven kind of makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Bar association was the topic of my talk with the Internet's Michael Swaim on episode 13, but we also took the time to discuss his work for IGN and the kinds of videos that the Internet craves. You were talking about time loops, how they're the new zombies, the new device yeah. du jour in sci-fi and pop culture. And of course, you have to do it. You, have to, you do a conceit where the video keeps rewinding and starting over. But also you tied the idea of the use of time loops to a growing sophistication in audiences via the Flynn effect and the acceleration of the phenomenon of nostalgic return. And you use the repetition not only as chapter breaks, but to reiterate some of the pretty wonky stuff that you were diving into. It was just like, mm, it, was, it was pretty good. Thank you. I'm really glad you act you saw that one because, yeah, that's, I think... <laughs> oh, the other ones aren't as good. <laughs> no, no, there's this thing at IGN because you intersect with celebrities sometimes there, which was not a thing at Cracked. So, yeah. like, I'll do this time loops piece that I spent a long time thinking deeply about and the editing and, you know, <laughs> taking the editing reins because I want it to be correct. And uh, right. it'll do decent. But a 30 second clip where I just ask John Goodman how his new movie was. And he goes, it was fun. <laughs> it was fun to do. Go see it in theaters. You know, it's like two million, million views. And, views. and you just yeah. have to <laughs> recognize that they're like different products <laughs> that serve a different yeah. purpose yeah. in people's lives. But uh yeah, the next one that's that's like that is this Star Trek piece. So I, that, I know oh, that'll be right up your that. alley, yeah. And finally, on episode 14, I was joined by podcaster and YouTuber Matt Baum to talk about the TNG episode, The Host. And one of the things that we discussed was the difficulty in translating Star Trek to the world of video games. Star Trek seems like it would be perfect for video games, and there's been a number of Trek games over the years. None of them has reached modern classic status or, or blockbuster hit status in the same way that Star Wars games have. Why do you think it's hard to make a Star Trek game? Oh, man. I think one of the things that makes Star Trek Star Trek is the ideas and the speeches and the, um, the philosophy. <laughs> press, press X to speechify. Yeah. Yes. So, and that's a tough thing to, to replicate um, in, in, in game form, which is why I think, you know, you see a lot of the Star Trek games that are out there are, you know, like build, your, build a spaceship and do space battles, which really isn't what Star Trek is. I don't think that's what a Star Trek fan is. I mean, Star Trek fans may be interested in that, but it, it feels almost like, you know, kind of an off-label use of the franchise of the, of yeah. the IP. Yeah. So I think the closest I've ever got to playing a game that felt like real Star Trek to me was maybe it was like 1993 or so. Whoa. And uh, it was on a dial-up BBS. If you can cast your mind back to the days <laughs> when you would have a modem attached to the computer and you would dial a local phone number and connect to a text only scrolling screen of, of, you know, just, just, just text, just text. Right. Right. And there was, um, I'm not sure if it was a role-playing game or what, but um, it was a game where you had a spaceship and you would fly around the galaxy and you'd go to star bases. And um, it was not, I don't think, I think it was a pretty asynchronous game. Like only a couple people could be connected to a BBS at a time, I think. Uh -huh. And um, something about that felt very natural to me. Like it felt like Star Trek um, for reasons I can't really put my finger on. I think it was just that, maybe it was the times being what they were. It just seemed suddenly so much more vast than any other kind of game I had ever played. And that is sort of a, a feel that I got from Star Trek, that the universe is incredibly vast. Um, that's, I think, something that's hard for a game to, to replicate unless you are, you know, getting online for the first time in your life, which is an experience you only have once. And that is it for one more year of enterprising individuals. I want to thank the listeners for sticking with the show, even through these past two very disjointed and discombobulating years in the world. We do our best here to bring you in-depth and insightful commentary on Star Trek. And if we've made your 2021 even a little bit better, we're glad of that. 
We'll be going dark for a little while as we ready the seventh season of Enterprising Individuals for Air, but that doesn't mean that the conversation has to stop. We're always talking Trek on social media and on Discord. You can find links to our social media spaces in the show notes. You can also become a crew member of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash EIST pod where you can sign up to get additional content from the show. And of course, we're still covering new episodes of Discovery, of Prodigy, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, and anything else that they can throw at us. So join us every Thursday at 8 p.m. Central live. For that, you can find links to when we go live on our Twitter at EISTPOD. You can also find Trek news and announcements on our Twitter. And that is about it. Have a happy and safe new year. You have earned it. And best wishes for this new year from myself and everyone at the Just Enough Trope Network. That's it for this year. We're signing off until 2022 and saying live long and prosper. Prosper.